Hello and, and welcome to uh, today's panel um, on the eve of uh, the 20th anniversary of the events of September 11. We are going to have a discussion on taking stock of 9-11 and its long-term implications, practicing counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, and building resilience at home and abroad. I'm Anton Bousquet. I'm a recent arrival here at, uh, at the Swedish Defense University, and I'm my great honor to moderate this panel with uh, five uh, fascinating and, uh, and, and rich participants. Let me quickly introduce them to you. We've got Anik Bibben, who is the inaugural Annalyn Professor of Gender, Peace and Security here at the Swedish Defense University. And she was uh, about to begin a, a fellowship in Bra at Brown's University on September 11, 2001. Uh, and she ended up spending four years at Brown's with the Info Peace Project. Uh, with James Vidarian. Her first book, Feminist Security Studies, a narrative approach, includes a discussion of the aftermath of 9 11. Uh, Shell Engelbreit is a professor of political science. Uh, he's a lifetime member of the Swedish Royal Academy of War Sciences and the Swedish Foreign Policy Society. He's also the director of the Transatlantic Security Program, which is obviously of high relevance to our discussion today. Caroline Holmquist is a senior lecturer in, in war studies. Uh, she's written extensively on liberal interventionism, uh, notably uh, a book on policing wars, on military intervention in the 21st century, an edited collection on war police and assemblages of intervention. And she's currently working on European social developments in relation to the war on terror. Marlene Carlson uh, is a lecturer in political science. She wrote her PhD dissertation on prolonged state failure in Afghanistan and Somalia. And she's recently been researching Afghan actors' responses to Swedish state building in Afghanistan. Uh, finally, but not least, Lars Wickman is a teacher in military strategy here at the Swedish Defense University. He's an officer in the Swedish Armed Forces. And in May this year, he defended his doctoral dissertation in political science at Uppsala University, in which he examined the building of political support for the Swedish military contributions to the international security force in Afghanistan. So I think we'll have a very rounded discussion with people bringing different levels of expertise for what, of course, is a very expansive subject, the question of the last 20 years or so uh, that followed the dramatic events um, of 9-11. In the first part of this panel, we'll, we'll be talking about those original events, reflecting on, on what happened in, in, the, in the first months and years that followed 9-11. Um, I will ask some of the participants about, about perhaps some of their recollections and, and their thoughts about particular lines of departure that we could trace back to that day. Um, I invite the contributors to, to tell us you know, a little bit about those events and, and refresh our memories, or for those of you viewers who perhaps were not even born on 9-11, uh, to fill in some, some of the blanks that might, that might be necessary in this, uh, on this uh, anniversary. Uh, uh, let me turn to, to Anik Wibben first. Um, Anik, you know, this panel is going to give, I think, quite a European flavor, of course, in terms of perspective on an event that, in the first instance, struck the United States. Uh, but you have perhaps a distinction of being present in the United States uh, on 9-11 and on the years that followed. So perhaps you could begin by telling us how you feel the event impacted the United States and what followed its aftermath. Yes, um, I'd be happy to. Um, I think um, one of the uh, sort of main thing I would like to stress from the very beginning is that looking back at it now, uh, we seem to think that we know um, what happened on 9-11, or we seem to know the meaning of these events. And um, I want to sort of take us back 20 years ago um, to that to that morning in September when um, you know when the planes hit um, the World Trade Center and also the Pentagon and another plane was sort of um, in the air people were wondering what would be happening which was a sort of stunning moment really of confusion um, it it wasn't at all clear at the time what was happening and um, I remember um, together with other people at the Watson Institute for International Studies where I'd just recently arrived for my fellowship um, to sort of be sitting in front of a, a rather tiny tv actually in the lunchroom um, and sort of following trying you know switching between the channels ABC, NBC, CBS, um, Peter Jennings on, on ABC I think was a sort of a, a stunning figure in that moment and, and people were just trying to figure out what is going on, right? What, why 
are, you know, why is there one plane? And then of course, uh, shortly thereafter, a second plane um, in the World Trade Center. Um, and then of course, later in that day, um, the, the center itself collapsing. I mean, it was really, and I wanna stress this, it was very confusing. Nobody really knew. Um, sort of where it was coming from, of course, immediately all kinds of uh, rumors were circulating and, and all kinds of assumptions about who might have done this and why and, and so forth. Um, but I think there, there was a moment in which, um, uh, you know, much of the, the population in, in the US um, and particularly also uh, people in, in um, New York City um, were just sort of stunned and confronted with this moment of vulnerability, right? It wasn't something that was necessarily in the repertoire uh, of the US to actually be vulnerable to um, this kind of attack. And, and what I find um, important also to think about that there was some, um, there was sort of two, uh, or but more probably, but two sort of different kind of narratives happening at the same time. So on the one hand, there was a very quick sort of, um, uh, what, what you might consider war, more uh, sort of March to war, um, where there was sort of a, a taking control by um, the Bush administration at the time, and sort of um, you know trying to direct this narrative very strongly into um, the narrative that has become sort of the um, founding moment for what we now consider to be the forever war. Um, but there was also another kind of narrative um, that was trying to um, hold on to this moment of, of maybe saying, oh, there's something happening here to the US that happens a lot to countries around the world and that happens to people around the world. And can we build something new from this moment? But it was um, quite quickly, I, I would say, shut down both from the US government, but also um, sort of from a variety of um, media outlets and, and it's sort of start of what we have now come to know as the sort of, um, it wasn't quite social media then because we didn't really have, um, you know, sort of the dominance of Twitter and, and, and these kind of blogs, but there was sort of a, a feeling um, in the sort of, I would say year to three years after that, um, you couldn't really say some things. There were sort of things that weren't actually um, allowed to be spoken out loud. And there were only some voices um, on the margins. And, and among them, I would say probably the project I was working with at the time, the infopeace.org um, website is still a testament to this, which we're trying to bring some kind of different types of analysis into this and which we're trying to take a much longer view um, on the on the conflict. And just to say one more thing about the march to war, I think uh, what is important to remember is that it wasn't predetermined. So it wasn't actually necessary to go down this route, but that decisions were made and many of these decisions had actually been taken, one might argue, before 9-11 to spin this event in a particular way. And I think this is really important to remember, especially at this point, 20 years later, um, as you know, operations in Afghanistan um, are um, basically drawn down. Um, you know, did we need to end up here? I think is a question that I would like to hopefully discuss with the rest of you. Thanks, Anita. Thanks for taking us back to that moment. The kind of uncertainty that surrounded it. You're absolutely right that, that it was an event which anyone who witnessed it would have will keep a very powerful memory of. And it, but it was also a moment where there was an opening up in terms of what could happen. There was a sense that things were not going to be the same after that. I think everyone could feel that at the time. But what that actually meant, I think, wasn't clearly preordained. But it got quite quickly shot shut down, and then we ended up with what became the war on terror, which is a narrative that's carried us through now for two decades. Um, which prompts me then to, to ask Shell, I mean, this question of, I mean, terrorism wasn't new. We, we lived with terrorism for, for decades uh, um, before that, but, but suddenly the way in which it was being discussed was different. Uh, so could you perhaps reflect for us on, on the initial governmental response in Sweden or in the West more generally, in terms of what it meant for practices of counterterrorism? Right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you can... We, we'd had terrorism certainly before in, in many parts of the world and, and uh, also in the Western countries in, in Western Europe and uh, not so much in the US, but we certainly didn't have uh, the experience of terrorism on this scale, right? So I would say that there's a novelty here of scale. 
And so I think you kind of sort you can you can sort of imagine uh, in the heads of state and government in almost over the world uh, are calling in their heads of intelligence and national security, uh, all these officials to ask them very basic questions. Uh, what just happened in the United States? Uh, who are the perpetrators? Um, and uh, what is their agenda? Uh, these kind of questions, I think, were sorted out fairly quickly, uh, in part because of this narrative, but also because some of the basic facts became uh, ascertained pretty quickly. But then there were uh, a second set of questions, I think, that were asked. And that is, uh, could something like this happen to us? Um, uh, and if so, uh, what kind of measures could we take to mitigate this or, or prevent this or, or, or manage this kind of problem? So uh, uh, counterterrorism was, uh, at, uh, was something that a couple of countries had some experience of, but certainly not all countries uh, in, in the Western world. And so uh, there was this real scramble uh, to create uh, a counterterrorism or organization, uh, legislation, um, uh, strategies uh, for, for dealing with this. And um, this happened both nationally, uh, it happened in terms of bilateral cooperation between these intelligence and security agencies, and multilaterally, and, and perhaps that last component was, was, was pretty new. Um, so nationally, uh, the U.S. took the lead, certainly, uh, in terms of legislation, uh, the Patriot Act was passed only 45 days after the event, and that paved the way for, well, a lot of the, what we're, we, we, we sometimes refer to as eavesdropping, the, the eavesdropping uh, uh, regulations uh, of the United States, and, and many other countries have kind of followed, followed that. Um, uh, the U.S. also um, uh, created the 9-11 Commission, which for a couple of years worked through why there was this intelligence failure. Uh, so you, you got um, a director of national intelligence that uh, was charged with coordinating the 50, 15 different agencies and trying to respond to this. Um, and and this, the city of New York even created its own little army of counterterrorism. Uh, that, that could respond to, to something similar. And a lot of other big cities in, throughout the world did something similar. Um, bilateral uh, inter intelligence work, uh, especially information sharing, was something that was a bit of a quick fix here in the beginning because there, was pocket of, there were pockets of information about what Al-Qaeda was, what, what their agenda was in parts of the world. So this happened fairly quickly. Uh, that uh, this the bilateral cooperation expanded. Uh, in Europe, we had the Club of Bern, uh, where European countries collaborate on, on intelligence issues. They uh, created a, a subgroup on, on counterterrorism. Uh, the G7, G8 countries also started uh, sharing more than, than they had previously. But the really novel thing, I think, was uh, what happened um, with multilateral counterterrorism work which really was unprecedented. Uh, intelligence uh, officials tend to like to share information with those that they trust. And, and multilateralism doesn't really have that kind of infrastructure of trust. So um, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution 1373 that paved the way for collaboration here on a level that we never had seen before. And it went uh, into a couple of different areas, the most important perhaps of which was the vetting of financial transactions. And that was uh, an attempt to go after terrorist financing. Uh, here they could build on work done previously by an organization uh, located in Paris, the FATF. Uh, so the FATF got a much broader mandate, but also at the UN uh, Security Council, uh, there was created a, a counterterrorism committee, and uh, a couple of years later, uh, uh, um, a counterterrorism executive directorate that then created a, a, di uh, a dialogue with basically every other UN member state, asking them, do you have legislation on counterterrorism? Do you have uh, 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 an organization unit that's charged with this? So basically, uh, every country in the world within 
uh, five to 10 years, established a counterterrorism strategy and organization and some kind of legislation. So that, that really was a revolution uh, in intelligence and counterterrorism uh, work throughout the world. And uh, it also had a number of side effects uh, that we can perhaps address later. Thank you. Uh, and you, you explained, I think, very clearly how this new agenda, this new issue of terrorism was, was now at the forefront of governments and profoundly altered governance in national and international context through an intensification of maybe systems of anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism that existed previously. But of course, one of the specificities of the war on terror was that the struggle against terrorism was framed through conventional warfare, through the military tool. And this, I think, is, was quite novel. And the United States ended up going to war in Afghanistan on the grounds that, that the Taliban were hosting Al Qaeda. It then went to war in Iraq on the, on, the, on the much more specious grounds that there was a connection between Iraq and either 9-11 or weapons of mass destruction. And the initial invasions in both cases appeared to be spectacularly successful. The US was demonstrating its military hegemony and, and, and uh, to great effect. But of course, what happened soon after was the emergence of insurgencies in Iraq first and, 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 and then in Afghanistan, which then defined war for the next 20 years or so um, and in which the US was then forced to fight the kind of war that it hadn't intended to fight, which was one premised on the principles of counterinsurgency. Uh, Lars, can you tell us a bit more about, about this turn to counterinsurgency and, and, and what it meant? Uh, yes, certainly. And uh, first of all, I would just like to, to thank you for the invitation and to sitting on this panel, distinguished scholars next to me, and uh, unfortunately offer a disclaimer as, uh, as well, since uh, I, I want to make clear that I'm speaking in the capacity of a researcher and not as a member of the Swedish Armed Forces. Uh, so the views that I present here, they are my own, and uh, they do not represent the Armed Forces at all. But it's, uh, it's interesting that you say this, that neither of these military operations actually started off as counterinsurgency operations. And I think that is one uh, very important thing to, to, to bear in mind. I, I, I would like to briefly touch upon some aspects of, 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 of COIN and how it played off, uh, out in the aftermath of 9-11. And then uh, I would like to focus on actually what we can learn uh, from these counterinsurgency uh, operations. So the bumper sticker slogan of COIN is winning the hearts and minds of the population. But what does that mean, actually? Uh, I mean, you could narrow it down in these two operations. It basically was protect the civilian population eliminate insurgent leaders and infrastructure and establish a legitimate government and societal functions. And I think that this last one is very important to bear in mind, and I will return to this uh, shortly, that this is not a purely military tactic. I mean, it's about applying a broad set of capabilities, uh, law enforcement, development aid, uh, education, healthcare, and so forth, as well as military. And there is an intrinsic difficulty, uh, difficulty here in balancing combat missions and state building activities. Uh, the Western states, I would say, have an intrinsic difficulty in combining military and civilian means. And this leads me to my first point uh, of the lessons that I hopefully can be learned from this. Wars should only be fought in pursuit of clear political goals. And here we had very reformist state building agendas. I mean, we were gonna build state with a centralized rules, democratic elected leaders, liberal market economy, respect for human rights as well. But there were competing strategic interests in these regions. Uh, the US had the one strategic interest to defeat terrorist groups. Another to uh, keep the country from becoming a safe haven for terrorists again and another to preserve regional stability. And neither of these three uh, goals or a strategic ob ob objectives, they are very hard to combine with this reformist uh, agenda. Uh, and, and I mean, these are things that we see in, in current uh, operations today, for example, in the Sahel region. I mean, there are difficulties uh, with the uh, UN operation, uh, for example, MINUSMA, and the, the French-led operation Barkhane in that area as, as well. So we see the same kind of problems. But there's also the things that the ends didn't meet the means or vice versa, the means didn't at all meet the ends. And uh, 
I mean, one problem with COIN is that military personnel is very expensive in capital, in human resources, time and political commitment. But, and perhaps more important, the military efforts did not match with the civilian efforts in these countries. So it was heavily tilted towards the military engagement, uh, which again is, 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 is a very um, um, problematic, I would say. And uh, some say that even when these uh, military operations turned into counterinsurgencies, it was either too late. I mean, it took eight years in Afghanistan. It took three years in uh, Iraq but also that it was too little. And especially, I would like to emphasize on the civilian side, especially too little. And the third and last point that I would like to uh, bring up is that the importance of critical thought and the continuous scrutiny of assumptions. In the uh, report from the Norwegian Commission on Afghanistan, uh, it, it stated quite frankly that the coin doctrine is based on a critical presumption that it was, uh, that was inadequately met in Afghanistan. And that was that a counterinsurgency operation will never be better than the regime it supports. And so both the government of Iraq and Afghanistan with the help of, of the, the international uh, uh, community, I mean, failed to garner the universal acceptance and the recognition of the majority of the population. And it was continuously tainted by corruption, election fraud, which made it a lot difficult uh, for this. Um, um, and, and there was also this assumption that uh, if we just uh, have elections, we defeat the Taliban insurgency, generous development assistance, that would eventually lead to good governments and not the other way around, that it, actually the good governance can lead to uh, um, the defeat of the Taliban surgery and to the uh, to the more democratization of these uh, nations. Thank you. So we've already started moving into trying to learn perhaps some lessons from the last twenty years and, and think about where we where we've arrived. So I suggest that's that's what we do in the time remaining uh, that we have. And in this spirit, I'm going to ask Caroline to to reflect a bit on where contemporary Western societies stand now in regard to the question of terrorism. Shale mentioned all the various uh, policy and governance changes that were enacted domestically, internationally. Do we live in societies that are today less vulnerable to terrorism, that are more resilient to um, the threat of attack? Um, <clears throat> well, I think there are so many different levels that we can that we can ask and answer these questions, but I think the kind of comments that I would like to make actually tie in with what you were starting out, Antoine, with the response of war to terrorism uh, and where you were going, Lars, with uh, the counterinsurgency operations. Because I think when it comes to understanding uh, where we are today in terms of countering terrorism, we need to kind of take stock of these 20 years and see like, you know, what we can pull out from them and where we are now. And I think what stands out to me more than anything um, is the conflation with counterterrorism and, and war fighting over the last two decades. Um, and I think it's, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to remember that this was considered so peculiar and so um, exceptional in the immediate post 9-11, uh, you know, period, like Anik was saying, there was nothing predetermined about this. It was something that came out uh, very soon and it was, it was kind of met with, um, you know, some some surprise and some, uh, you know, th there was a sense that this wasn't the only way in which you could have responded um, to 9-11. So this kind of ostracizing of the sort of war on terrorism, saying that was something um, strange and, and foreign, um, you know, in fact, of course, we know that it proved extremely durable and um, it's been institutionalized, it's been bureaucratized, uh, even among like the staunchest critics of the US invasion, um, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, um, in a way, that kind of um, immediate post 9 11 Bush Blair kind of response became a bit camouflaged or hidden from sight, uh, disappearing a bit in these grandiose ambitions, the large scale military interventions, these what Roy Stewart's call these irresistible illusions of what can be done uh, where the fight against terrorism teams up with everything that within the humanitarian kind of economic um, agenda, democracy promotion um, and so on. 
but what I'd like to pull out is that it was always there. It was always, it was there throughout and it's there now, the, meaning like the, the, kin, the kinetic war against terrorism, the, um, the real hard uh, war fighting. And it's sometimes brought out in opposition to like the large scale military interventions as if they are about winning hearts and minds. And then there's something else, this shadow war going on where you've got drone operations and special forces operations and that's something different. Of course, it was always two sides um, of the same coin and they occasionally bro you know, burst out into the open and, and kind of re-emerged in, in the very same guise as they did in the immediate post 9-11. So after the attacks in, in Paris in 2015, then Francois Hollande comes out and he says exactly what George Bush said. And he said, nous sommes en guerre, we're, we're at war. Uh, the response is going to be merciless. Uh, David Cameron about the same time, you know, went out and, and uh, you know, made the case for uh, Britain going to war in Syria and said that, you know, you're, anyone opposed to this war was a terrorist uh, sympathizer. So it was, it, it, it stayed this kind of war response to terrorism. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, it's thought of as some kind of, um, you know, conflation of war fighting and terrorism or conflation of war fighting and policing. Um, and that this has a kind of logic or a way of rationalizing war. Um, in fact, it's of course, it's not just a rationalization. There's a real kind of uh, hard uh, material reality to it. And I think the term that I uh, would like to put out there, which is uh, really a favorite term of mine, um, the French philosopher Grégoire Chamayou calls the manhunts. So this idea that there is a kind of, um, you know, terrible mix, the enfant terrible of police and army, and that these this comes out in the manhunt. And I think that's very much where we are today. So um, when we have... Um, you know, like the debacle in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, we've, we've totally come full circle. And, um, um, you know, what, when Joe Biden comes out and says, actually, this is the end to nation building, it's a pledge to go back to the original, the core, uh, the fight against terrorism, but he is really returning to that kind of kinetic individual targeting manhunt, uh, which is not just a narrow counter terrorism practice, but something that actually has to do with the way in which we think about political authority, about enmity, about questions like this. So I think really where we are now in terms of combating terrorism is that we're back. We've got that it's it's back to the manhunt. And that's that's where, it, you know, as it looks to me, the foreseeable um, future. So this was less an answer about societal resilience, but I think this is the best answer I can give to the question of where we are in terms of combating terrorism. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, then that, that leads me to, to, to Malene uh, neatly enough, because one of the, I mean, it's in, unavoidable that when we're having this discussion today, of course, we're, we're in the wake of the withdrawal of, of Afghanistan. And it feels like the end of a cycle. We don't know yet what's coming next, and, but this year it definitely feels like a chapter has closed. Uh, and with that, a sense perhaps that this huge apparatus of counterinsurgency doctrine that was produced around it is going to be left behind, that, that the US probably doesn't want to do this anymore. Uh, and I guess that's my question to me. What's, what's left of counterinsurgency? Is, is, is there a future for counterinsurgency? What, what is the willingness of the US and the West to be involved in, in such operations and, and its correlate, which is basically nation building and reconstructing other people's societies? Um, where do we stand in that regard? Very interesting that you mentioned full circle because that's pretty much where I was going to start. So I think for the near future, there won't be any kind of big state building projects like we've seen in Afghanistan because uh, Afghanistan incurred so much political or financial costs and it's shaken the state building community to its core. Like I think a lot of soul searching is going on at the moment. But in saying that, I think that the Western state and the idea of the Western state is so closely connected to state failure and state building that in the future, there will be similar operations or maybe not similar, but there will be some form of Western involvement to, to build states to, for West, Western security. Um, and I think that's because the West identify itself itself against the other, the failed state. And therefore, yeah, it will continue. The sad part about this is because the West has so close, like <clears throat> its identity so closely related to state failure to identify something as the other, it also misses those kind of unintended consequences that I think Lars touched up, upon a little bit. 
So for instance, the Afghan state, the foundation for the Afghan state was never there. There was never uh, like, we, the West just picked whoever was good enough <laughs> to kind of build this Afghan state and like produce something that would mirror a Western state image kind of, but it was never, it was artificial. So there isn't much to build on and it almost created like a interdependency. So the Afghan state needed the West for its support and yeah, financial support and corrupt, yeah, get themselves rich too, the Afghan elite, but the West also needed the Afghan state in the war on um, the Taliban that also became like involved in part of the war on terror. So I think that the Western identity is also closely connected to the Taliban being the bad guys. And that's going to be really, really hard then to form, I think, in what I found that yeah, Afghan needs an elite solution, like an elite agreement. And if the Taliban are seen as the bad guys by the West, it's never going to be able to do this local kind of agreement that the West have been talking about for a long time. So I think, yes, in the short term, there might be a um, stop to involvement overseas to kind of extend the national security to Afghanistan. But in the long term, I think that because Western identity is so closely connected to this other being a failed state, it will almost be inevitable that it happens again. Thank you. Um, I think I want to explore this idea a little bit more of, of this idea of the, the cycle and, and because so many, when we look at this, these last 20 years and even beyond that, there's a sense of, of a kind of set of vicious cycles and loops that we can't get out of. When we think about the whole construct of the war on terror, the whole point of the war on terror was, well, we're going to win this war against terror, we're going to defeat terror. And yet over 20 years uh, of wars and counterterrorism, uh, we've probably done more to feed terrorism than to defeat it. I and mean, we think about in, uh, on 9-11, we were talking about an organization, Al-Qaeda, that probably had a few hundred members. A dozen years later, we've got an Islamic state that's taking over half of uh, or large chunks of the, of, the, of the Middle East. You can you know, uh, ask for a more patent disavowal of, that, of, of the, the effects of that policy. Um, similarly, uh, we, we've now got to a point where we've had to withdraw from Afghanistan and the group that we ousted is back in government. Um, and we are now having to you know, abandon or distance ourselves from these policies of, of, of counterinsurgency. But, but as Edith Malin says, this, we could see this coming back again. I mean, after all, if you take a longer perspective, we could go back to the Vietnam War, where the United States got sucked into that, uh, also got into counterinsurgency, and then said, no, we're not going to do this again. And within 20 years, we were back at it. So I guess my question for the panel is, you know, are there any signs here that, that we're learning any lessons? Uh, are we going to break this cycle? Uh, and if we were to break this cycle, what should we be doing? So I think... Um... I mean, this question, whether more terrorism was spawned by the response or by the, uh, the initial attack and, and the successor attacks we had in Europe in 2005 uh, and 2004 and, and, and five, uh, Madrid and London and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, had, we even had, had a, a failed one here in Stockholm in, in 2010. Um, uh, I think that that's a debate that's we're always going to have. It's a counterfactual, basically. So, so that's going to be a problem. But that the that the United States overlearned and overcompensated for not having been pre prepared for for 9/11. I think that's a everybody would agree on that. Uh, so, so, so that's an obvious. I think the one uh, silver lining I think I can see is what I was referring to uh, increased. Uh, cooperation uh, bilaterally and multilaterally in dealing with some of these issues uh, to the extent that they are real issues. I think that that is a plus. I think that in, intelligence organizations, security agencies are uh, trusting each other more, co collaborating more uh, internationally is I think one of the few gains in terms of, but, but for the most part, I would say, yes, overlearning, overcompensating and, and uh, wreaking havoc uh, doing so. Please, Annick. Yeah, um, 
I think I would like to come in with something that I had hoped to maybe also mention in the beginning, which is the, the sort of um, instrumentalization of, of women and women's rights, um, which I, I feel we have learned nothing, actually. Uh, and um, I'm feeling like uh, there is a deja vu at the moment when I hear people say, oh, you know, now the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan is going to, you know, leave women behind once again, as though um, this wasn't sort of the case throughout. And also, you know, as though women hadn't been instrumentalized from the very beginning. I mean, on uh, it was in November 17, 2001, I think, when Laura Bush um, for the first time went on, on the radio, gave an address, uh, gave basically the presidential address to the nation and said, you know, we are going into Afghanistan to, to save women. And now we are like, leaving Afghanistan and we still haven't saved the women. And in the meantime, we of course also had, um, you know, the sort of female engagement teams, which were specifically supposed to be saving women as part of COIN. And it seems like this whole time we haven't learned uh, one thing about, um, you know, this is not a, a, an opportunity to sort of, um, you know, impose our understandings. I think, Marlene, we, what you were talking about, this idea that, you know, it's it's always our, um, our you know, Western or whatever you want to call it, um, sort of opportunity to save this other. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people can't do it for themselves. And I think um, if if we were, or if I were to, to plead for some lessons to learn, it would be that, um, we would have to sort of um, you know, get over our own hubris and, you know, the idea that we know what to do. And actually, you know, I wish that you were wrong, I mean, and that we wouldn't be coming back to the state building narrative in the same way. Um, and maybe instead be a little bit more humble in, in what we think uh, we can achieve, which goes also to Lash's point about this question of, you know, what actually are the political aims right of of what we are doing and can these ever be achieved with military force right and what what's the connection here which i think also uh, caroline you were you were mentioning and and i think um the sort of microcosm of of sort of um the whole narrative around women whether it's in in the afghan case but also more generally in the war on terror i think is, is an illustrative example of of the sort of broader problems that we see in the whole um, uh, sort of story of, of the last 20 years. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think um, there's so many, there's so many strands here that, but I think one thing that, that, that stands out for me is this kind of movement between um, individuals and some kind of group, however defined in some kind of collective. Um, and that collective, you know, builds an identity like you're pointing out and how, you know, in order to con construct ourselves, we need this other, etc. cetera. Um, at the same time, the practices that have developed over these years, you know, in the whole range um, have led to such um, that they become so internalized in the liberal democratic state within neoliberal governance that it's impossible now to extract um, and, and, you know, one from the other. So we can look at these like, in, you know, isolated examples of like Shell was saying, you know, a, a silver lining of, of particular types of cooperation and uh, between, uh, you know, intelligence agencies from different countries and so on. But I think the, the real rut that we are in, in terms of trying to explain what's gone wrong and why have we created more terrorists and, and why are we in this full circle is that we, we just so, it, you know, embroiled in it. We're so we're so um, invested with um, the whole reasoning that, that the way in which war has become kind of tied in with the idea that we can, um, you know, prevent a kind of a, a criminal act, a terrorist act, and we can do so globally. And in order to do so, we need to build, you know, you know, below these institutions that um, that are meant to be resilient um, in all kinds of ways, but that end up reproducing the kind of the militarized structures that ostensibly they're just kind of complement or, you know, stand in, um, in contrast to. So I think that's, I think that's the real difficulty is that we are so um, 
imbricated with the war on terrorism now that, you know, from the surveillance state to the kind of um, extrajudicial practices that have evolved, uh, you know, the secrecy, the cooperation around, you know, CIA detention centers around the world or what have you. And, um, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's the reason I like this idea of manhunt, because it shows how going after individuals becomes an organizing logic. Mm. Um, and that logic is difficult to kind of square with either war as we know it, or liberal democracy as we know it. And we end up with this kind of huge complex where we can't disentangle the one from the other. And I think that's part of the reason that we're not breaking that cycle um, or circle. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Lars, I mean, do you, do you feel that from the military perspective, there's a desire within militaries to just forget about counterinsurgency, to put this behind uh, behind us and just move on to, or return to perhaps uh, military preparations that feel more familiar or, or more comfortable? Yes, uh, I would say definitely. Uh, that is the, and it's, it's no different from the US or, or in, in Sweden as, as we are. I mean, the, we, the the return of the uh, of the strategic narrative of the the um, uh, returning uh, geopolitical uh, situation between the greater powers the us russia and china is one of the the biggest implications so i think that to an extent uh, one tries to forget about the failure in afghanistan and iraq because that's basically what we ended up with, it was a failure. So I think that definitely there is this move of forgetting and uh, moving on, actually. Precisely that, that kind of willingness to forget and an amnesia that's going to probably <laughs> lead us back to where we were. But um, Malin, do you want to come in? I'm just thinking that it, we should really try to think of the consequences, the actions of the West when they conduct state building. We should analyze that more in terms of not only what, what our aims are when we are doing state building, but what would be the consequences of our objective. And that's not really done, I don't think. that, And that's part of what Lars mentioned, that it, it's really important to have this like critical thinking and questioning, even on a policy level and for policymakers. And as you said, that amnesia is not going to help that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To learn from the past, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, just uh, a small point, but I'm thinking if we place also 9 11 um, in the kind of the post Cold War context, so we write that history rather than go back to the other counterinsurgency wars, mm -hmm. but to go back to this idea of a particular type of world order that that for a while in this interregnum period between the end of the Cold War and 9 11 really um, was so much about the idea that there was it was possible to create norms around which you could intervene militarily around the world to save lives and so on. Um, and uh, I can't remember who said this, but you know, it was about in the endeavor to kind of create a new world order, you know, leaders found themselves saying that like, this is not the new world that we ordered. We ordered a, <laughs> we ordered a different one. And, and I think that's, you know, we're kind of still in that, that this kind of, um, um incredulous feeling like how did how did this actually how did all of those agendas become so um intertwined and i think that i think that was also one of the you know interesting you know narratives really i think in the post cold war period and then what what carries over into the post war on terror era is um is really this kind of um um yeah idea that that people who were then, you know, propagating for norms around which you could intervene militarily, you came out on this kind of the responsibility to protect agenda and so on, and found themselves in the immediate post 9-11 period in this kind of, you know, oops, we're ending up, we're ending up now on like the war on Iraq side, that all of a sudden it looked like that agenda was, you know, that agenda was co-opted um, in terms of what that military campaign was meant to. So it became this kind of, you know, how narratives shift in and out of each mm -hmm. other. And, and, um, and I think, uh, you know, that was, it, it came back the, the idea of, of creating a, a certain type of liberal order and that there would be norms and so on. Uh, but we did so with like this twin side of like the dark war on terror always going on and, and always being a necessary kind of other to the, the liberal ambitions and the, you know, hoping for a new world order kind of 
kind of thing. A neat mm. yeah. If I could uh, come in on that, I think what, one of the things to remember also is like, so we, you know, we have this tendency to look at it, of course, uh, given where we sit, to, to look at these things sort of from our perspective, from the North, from the West, uh, from the, you know, current former colonial uh, powers um, and, and, you know, to sort of say like, oh, this is a new moment for us. And yet if we shift our perspective slightly, this is an old story, right? It's the old story I think that Malin was uh, alluding to of, uh, you know, sort of uh, us coming in and, and sort of doing things somewhere and that sort of are really about us and, and about our way of, of seeing the world or, or what we think is good and, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, market economies or, or, you know, what we think democracy is. And, and it's always funny because the, the United States, of course, has sunk deeply on the democracy index itself. Um, and, and maybe there's some time to sort of look homeward a little bit. So I think if we, if we shift our perspective and we, uh, as I was trying to say, like, well, whether we do it, you know, we sort of look from the perspective of women or whether we look from their perspective of, um, you know, the sort of majority world, which has been subject to this kind of intervention and um, this kind of uh, sort of meddling, um, whether under great new principles or, you know, old principles, it doesn't necessarily look all that different. And, and I think um, maybe sometimes that would be you know, pedagogically also, um, since we are at a university, a good opportunity to think maybe a little bit differently uh, about what it is. And maybe maybe the lessons are um, are different once once we do that. Yeah, no, I, I was uh, I'm stuck with this metaphor of having ordered this uh, <laughs> world. Uh, uh, that that the, there's an assumption there that there is a menu from which to 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 choose. Uh, perhaps we are just offered the daily special. I mean, there's there's just one thing on the menu, and 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 perhaps it was Al Qaeda that provided that 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 daily special, and and so we, everybody was 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 prompted to act, and I think the the reactive mode of 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 the Western world is uh, certainly what Anik was talking about, the, the sense of vulnerability that really the United States had not had since the Second World War, I think explains quite a lot of what then unfolded in terms of uh, US responses, I think. Um, I've been fascinated in the last couple of weeks with uh, a number of documentaries coming out of the United States and also a newspaper coverage of, 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 of the anniversary uh, that there seems to be a pretty, a pretty cohesive view about a lot of things that happen around this, but then there's this political polarization also kind of overlaying all of that. But there was a very fascinating article to me in New York Times today, where they had interviewed people from different kids from 12 different countries, um, and what kind of uh, how they were taught about 9-11. And there were just a few countries where they taught anything about 9-11. And, and, and those were very different things that they, 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 they were taught. So I'm thinking also in terms of the, the internationally, how people will be looking at this, if we see a kind of fragmentation going on in terms of how the perceptions will remain. Because we who remain, I, I was not in the US, but I, I, I didn't have all these channels, but I had CNN and I actually wa watched uh, live television of the second plane. I, I feel almost like a witness myself because of that. Uh, it's um, we have that visual view of what happened, but but the younger people uh, growing up now, it seems to be a very fragmented view of how to interpret what what this really was and and how and perhaps the responses are also affecting uh, very much how people view the original sin, if you like, the original act. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so uh, I'm, 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 I'm quite fascinated by how, 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 uh, how we people will look at this in, 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 in another 10 years, let's say. We'll meet again. <laughs> yeah, I, I just have to say, I, I think that's, um, that's so interesting that, that kids were not taught about 9-11 because I think 
all of us who you know were around it that it was such a you know it was such a watershed event it really was the event that that you know changed i mean didn't change everything materially but it changed perceptions mm -hmm. uh, dramatically and it became such a rallying kind of political force and so for us to think that 9-11 was not meaningful is just anathema like we you know at least the way that i that i think of it and and um and to then say that well maybe you know young young people now um don't don't single it out as the event the way that that our generation has and um and and i mean i i can only understand that in terms of how um those agendas have become so normalized and so institutionalized and bureaucratized and and um you know made mundane that that um that for them that you know that's just that's just this ongoing uh you know terrorism thing it's just it's just part of like the air that they breathe and and for us it was no it was an agenda that appeared and it didn't necessarily have to be that agenda it could have been a different agenda it could have been a different response um and it's difficult to get that into your head it also makes you feel very old <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> um, you've somewhat preempted my, my next question which was to, to reflect on the fact that when the events 9-11 happened and the first years that followed, there was a strong sense of exception, exceptionality. Everyone said, this is not normal times. Mm -hmm. We're going to do things we wouldn't normally do. We're going to institute you know, domestic measures that we wouldn't otherwise. Mm -hmm. We would deploy force in ways that we wouldn't have thought and so forth. Um, but of course, that sense of exceptionality has disappeared now. And, and many things have just kind of receded into the background. So I'd like you to reflect a bit on what has become the new normal? I mean, what are the things that are now in the background that we no longer question, but just weren't there before 9-11? Before I mean, of course, you could think of fairly anodyne and nonetheless significant things such as you know, increased airport security. Uh, you actually used to be able to take water on a plane uh, that you bought somewhere else than in the, in the, um, uh, in the airport uh, uh, shops uh, and so forth. But uh, are there other things that, that you know, that people who will not have experienced life before 9-11 will just maybe themselves not even be aware mm -hmm. uh, and no longer there. But I think we all are affected in this way, I think, by, by normalization, as you put it. I think one thing actually on the, the airport thing is, mm -hmm. is one that for sure is part of the normal. In, and, and I think of that in terms of like the body and how the body is, uh, you know, everything that we've done in terms of biometrics and in terms of how our bodies are coded into huge landscapes of like security and, and identification of threats to security. And I think that is very much the new normal that we are so, um, that, that is just such a natural part of uh, people's everyday life. And it goes along with like, you know, measuring your heartbeat and checking, you know, your how many steps you've taken or whatever. Like it's, it's all about this kind of, um, you know, instrumentalization of the body um, and and how that has appeared. And it's, I think that's one thing that, that definitely stands out for me. And, and it hangs together, of course, with like information and the internet and stuff. But yeah, just, um, yes, it's, um, so maybe that's one thing that feels normal for young people, that we can remember something before. Yeah. Yeah. I remember in 2003, uh, it was the first time I came back to New York, I think, after the event. I, I was there just a few months also prior to the event um, and decided not to go up in the towers, for instance, <laughs> too long queue. Um, but in 2003, I was there uh, just for a day and I had to carry my carriage throughout Manhattan for the whole day because there was no storage. There was absolutely no place in, in, in downtown Manhattan you could store stuff because they were afraid you were uh, you know, walking around with a, with, with a huge bomb. So, so that's one thing. Uh, another thing, uh, um, I think the technological revolution, uh, communications revolution in particular, information revolution, uh, all these things that could be done technologically in terms of not least uh, intelligence uh, work, uh, the, the kind of eavesdropping program that was made uh, possible through the Patriot Act and a number of uh, uh, subsequent uh, acts that, that were uh, adopted by, by the United States, but, but also a number of other countries. That also kind of fits into the picture. I think I, in, in a different era, perhaps, you couldn't have this kind of omnipresent uh, eavesdropping organization going on and, and the, the uh, um, being able to sift through uh, 
uh, uh, electronically, these enormous amounts of data, emails and SMSs and all that stuff, uh, in order to, to try and find something that could be traced to uh, a terrorist plot. That's also something that just happened to take place at the same time as, uh, in, uh, to, as, as uh, terrorism and, and the counter-terrorist response uh, it, it developed. So I, I think that's also something to, to, to remember that this technology revolution is kind of entangled with what we've seen uh, in terms of uh, counterterrorism response. It certainly drove through many policies in terms of surveillance and curtailing of certain civil liberties. There was just no opposition that could be raised at the time. It was just everything was justified on the, the fight against terrorism. And of course, none of that has ever been wound back. It's just become the standard uh, and it's not even part of the political debate in a significant way, even when the revelations of, uh, um, of Snowden came out and we found out how deep the NSA surveillance went. Well, it, it, there was coverage for, for several months, but it didn't actually change anything at all. It didn't raise it back to a major political issue. It didn't lead to any, any pullback on it, just well, let's sweep some of it under the carpet and, and call it something different and, and, and try and classify it again. Another thing that's really interesting, sort of thinking about kind of almost like unintended consequences, because I remember um, in in the sort of aftermath of 9-11, of I mean, the, the, the media debate was definitely um, dominated by traditional uh, news networks, NBC, um, so in the US, right, NBC, ABC, um, CBS, you know, the big anchors were uh, sort of driving initially the narrative and, and then, you know, they were like the CNNs and the sort of the, that newer um, sort of um, uh, group of broadcasters as well. But there was a strong sense that, that there needed to be some sort of alternative media, right? That, that, that we needed some sort of independent media. So like, for example, channels like Democracy Now, they are sort of a, an outgrowth actually of, of this. And, and then the sort of, you know, on the one hand, we have this democratization of, of the media space and the debate. And on the other hand, we get what we have now, which is the, the sort of, um, you know, the Fox News and, and the, the Reddits and, and the sort of type of media um, environment where um, you can have, uh, you know, part of the population be completely in one bubble and another part of the, the sort of population be completely in another bubble. And you don't actually have that sort of common public debate space anymore and i think that's a that's a really interesting one because i i remember at the time um, and this was also partly something we were doing with the project we were talking about sort of you know sort of critical media spaces and alternative media and tactical media and how do we use media to have a different kind of narrative but those all those things that seemed at the time to be sort of a positive um, technological change and opportunity of things we could do with these these new um, communication technologies in particular, um, they have been uh, very much sort of, I don't know, do I say hijacked, but they have been taken up by, by forces that are now using them to do exactly the opposite and to close spaces for debate and to make it impossible for, for us to have these broader conversations. So I think that that's, that's another sort of interesting um, element of this, which isn't necessarily, you know, good or bad, but it, it, it has certainly become part of this. Um, and, and at the same time, spaces like Twitter and, and so forth have also given opportunity to people who have traditionally been excluded from, um, you know, whether it's spaces of academia or, or uh, media and so forth to sort of raise their voices. And we have movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and, and so forth, which ha have really, um, taken up that space and and you know sort of used it to their advantage so i think there's there's a lot going on that isn't um you know that isn't just about 9 11 but i think has a lot to do with with the the reactions and the, the sort of space um that was created afterwards so i, I think uh, um and it's normal to to us now mm. i think I'm not sure if um, this is not really my area, but I'm thinking that maybe it also coupled terrorism a lot more to Islam, which was not the case maybe so much before 9-11. And that has led to Islamophobia. And we've seen even world leaders taking really Islamophobic stance, mm -hmm. which might have been a consequence. Mm 
of mm. this. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's the the whole the the huge reckoning with democracy and what democracy is, and I mean that's one part. Uh, the refusal to roll back intrusive, uh, you know, practices and part of the state in terms of infringements on civil liberty or surveillance or any kind of you know tracking of the population, that kind of stuff. Um, and and at the same time, this kind of so we've got this this ostensibly big project been going on for 20 years about building liberal democracy somewhere. Um, at the same time, we've got this huge deficit in terms of democracy in our own societies and a whole kind of, you know, the rise of populism and what that has meant and it hangs together with the media and what you were saying, Anik, but but it does seem that, you know, that, that this should be some kind of, you know, I, I would wish for some kind of you know, uh, reckoning with democracy and what it is and, and something that is other than, you know, the, the whole kind of um, neoliberal governance structure that we've built and that, that, that there are questions, you know, inherent, like foundational questions of democracy that are not addressed at all within, you know, the neoliberal debates or within the way in which we've conceived of, um, you know, going elsewhere and building democracy and so on, but that have to do with trust and that have to do with, you know, citizenship and, um, mm. yeah, I, I, you know, maybe maybe that is a moment uh, that, that that could um, could come out of all of that, you know, authoritarian-ish slash neoliberal intrusive practices, and the populists and the Trumps and the Orbans, and that possibly we can see that, you know, face the challenge to democracy that seems to be there um, and seems to be very much tied to the last 20 years and the kind of dismantling and, and raising of new structures that has been going on. Uh, that's an yeah. important point you raise, this question of trust, because I think we can't neglect the extent to which the whole narrative of the war on terror and what happened also bred huge amounts of cynicism within Western audiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's it fed huge conspiracy theories. I mean, mm. you talk about how 9/11 is interpreted, but there are large segments of the population who, who don't believe official accounts at all. Mm. And that sense of cynicism uh, with government, with what became known as the deep state, that's proliferated. Of course, uh, we live in a highly conspiratorial moment, I and mean, think of COVID as the, the exemplary. But so I think there's clearly a degradation of trust mm -hmm. in policy in politics just generally and in the media and so forth and the war on terror surely has played a role in that I, I think a huge role and I think it was Honora O'Neill a British philosopher who like formulated that, that a question at, at the sometime just in the you know not so far after 9-11 but but the question was like what comes first democracy or trust and can they like can we can we think of those two you know, in a different kind of relationship. Um, and yeah, and then I guess the the old thing about trust just being so difficult to build and so quick to shatter. And uh, I mean, at the same time, you, you had from the very beginning, I think, you know, thinking back to Bush's address to the nation on the evening of 9-11, and it was basically like, don't worry, go shopping, trust us, we got you, right? Yeah. So there was sort of this like, you know, you give us all your trust. And mm -hmm. then I think maybe there's something here where that trust was betrayed. Mm -hmm. You know, when when we think, for example, about, you know, when when the, the first images appeared from the, the prisoner um, sort of torture, harassment and so forth at um, Abu Ghraib, or, uh, you know, when we learned about the sort of ways in which, um, you know, torture was made acceptable again and, and all of these kind of um, practices that, you know, seemed, I think in that beautiful moment after the end of the Cold War, right, when the world was going to be new and shiny and wonderful, um, you know, it seemed like we had gotten to this moment where, you know, there was some sort of universal acceptance for human rights. They were like, you know, everybody was writing about the proliferation of norms around the world. Um, and then we have, you know, shortly after 9-11, we have, you know, Rapsfeld sort of saying like, well, if I can stand, then, you know, standing cannot be torture and therefore you know I, I think they're this sort of like you know trust us we got you and then at the same time a sort of consistent sort of betrayal of that trust probably you know at some level played into that that people are now saying that well you say I should trust you but should I really because I have you know never mind the people who immediately went to you know this thing didn't happen and there's the, the conspiracy theories the hard ones. 
I think there is some level at which, you know, yeah, maybe when when you don't deserve the trust, you also don't get it. And it's really hard to rebuild. Mm. But I think in state building too, that element of trust is lacking. And that's yes. also why it hasn't even been possible to try to build a state in Afghanistan mm. or a, a Western state. Mm. Mm. Let's see if we've got any questions from our from our audience. Um, any of the any of the viewers, if you want to ask a question, it's your chance. Please come in if you want. I'll let our viewers reflect a bit longer on what they might want to ask. And, and, Maybe try another one. Um, I think Europeans have tended to to th think that they would they had a different approach to things that they would have done things differently. Um, and I want to query that whether that's the case, whether whether fundamentally when it comes to the war on terror there was a, a European alternative to what became a U.S. dominated uh, war. Uh, I mean, Caroline's already pointed to the parallels between. Also, Hollande's reaction to the attacks in Paris and, and what we'd heard 15 years earlier from, from the US president. So, so yes, are, you know, we, are, we, are we flattering ourselves to think that we, would, we had a better way or a different way? Um, or, or, or was it really, would it be more the same and was more the same? Mm. Yeah. I, I, would, I, would, uh, I would guess it would have been quite similar if we'd had a united polity. Now that we don't, that we have the European Union, uh, it wouldn't be possible to, to organize that kind of response. But given that Europe would have been subjected to something on that scale, I mean, I, I don't know where that would have been, perhaps Brussels, the Council of Ministers, something like that. Uh, I, 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 would, I would assume that the Europeans would have uh, responded also on a on a large scale. I think that was there was this very interesting point when they almost had uh, Osama bin Laden and and his cohort uh, pinned down in the Bora Bora Mountains, and so, some military experts have recently said that they could have focused all their attention and they could have taken it out. And at that point, somebody decided, no, this is too small a canvas. We need to occupy Afghanistan, and and it's we have to have something of a pro symbolically proportionate response to this huge attack on the United States. Um, but that would have been a more appropriate response, a more uh, and one that wouldn't have elicit uh, this kind of um, the, the 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 danger of breeding more terrorism, uh, both in Afghanistan and 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 in other parts of of, of the world. So, so, uh, so I, I come back to this notion of the scale of this uh, uh, was was something that predisposed, I think, the United States to lash out so strongly. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think um, I think in a way it is um, it is to flatter oneself to say that there was a, there would have been a very different European um, response. At the same time, I think that. Like the, the Francois Hollande quote shows that this, you know, the US spiral, I think that was something that, that did make a difference uh, to Europe. And I mean, Europe had experience with terrorism and there was, you know, the, the IRA or the Basque, you know, there was a different, there was a, I mean, obviously this is all huge generalizations, but I would say that there was more of an idea that terrorist, like the, the, um, what's it, what's the word, the prescription of terrorist groups or the listing of terrorist groups that people get, get on a list and then get off a list because they moved into the political realm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the IRA would be one example like that. And, and that maybe there was more, that the, Europe was more attuned to the idea that we think of certain groups as terrorists at certain points in history, and then they're in the political fold at other points. And, and that, that, that there's not a, there's not a kind of category or, or, or label of terrorism which is forever and and you know static which i think is the way that it was made in the u.s version of the war on terror and possibly because the u.s didn't you know yes there there are like the experience of white supremacist kind of um terrorism but that was never conceived as a uh you know an identity challenge and it was never labeled terrorism either so 
and, I, and in Europe, we did have a vocabulary for terrorism, maybe in a different way, but mm. I think very quickly this was this became a, a, such a powerful narrative that whatever experience was there with the IRA, with, with the Basque or whatever, it just, just kind of, it was just gone, like mm. within the whole whirlwind of this new monolithic terrorism where you were a terrorist, and once you were a terrorist, you were a terrorist forever, mm. and there's nothing that kind of um, changed that, and, and that it's an identity that is stable that idea was different. it's also yeah. very much the us versus them narrative right it's, it's Sorry, the, the, like either you're with us or you're with yeah, them yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah. And, and, and so yeah. and, I, and i think we need to sort of you know as, as sort of scholars in in this in this area also kind of maybe um you know look look inward a little bit because i think um you can you can read a lot of this in in terms of uh, you know the theories uh, about how these things should work that have been proliferating mm. for so long, right? Mm. So that that there, it, it, you know, whether we are talking about proportionality of the response or this idea that you know uh, Afghanistan needed to be needed to be attacked because it was you know sort of hosting the Taliban, uh, which is you know a really kind of actually a difficult case to make when the Taliban wasn't actually the official government of Afghanistan. And at the time was only you know in charge of part of the country i mean all of these kind of things so could you really speak of a state functioning state in our imaginary um hosting a terrorist group when the borderlands between afghanistan and pakistan were actually not so clearly defined and were they really host like i mean so i think the these kind of like assumptions that that sort of structure our broader understanding of how um, the world works according to to theories of, of international politics and so forth also play into how this was interpreted and then and sort of the the response that was accepted and those are yes in some way you could say maybe more American um, but they certainly also have an influence in, in Europe as a whole even though I think the point about you know having some experience with, with sort of local terrorism um, would maybe you know soften that a little bit but um, yeah. do you want to come in for this we have a question but if you want to come in for yeah. no no i was just uh, thinking that we were just making a reference to afghanistan and pakistan and we had a we question we had a question and in fact a question i think which is on to as well which caroline was saying about you know, the flexibility and elasticity of the concept of of terrorism um the question is uh, from uh, najam I'm, I'm sorry if i just pronounced that name uh, Najam asks, all the, uh, she in, uh, asked about the efforts that uh, the US dedicated to building a modern state structure, but uh, in, in Afghanistan, uh, but points to the fact that, of course, some of the challenges on the ground were also linked to a longer history. Uh, and of course, one of the problems with the concept of the war on terror is that very much it abstracted the, the, uh, the events of September 11 from a longer, from a longer history, and notably the implications of the US in Afghanistan, its relationships with uh, Mujahideens and even including with bin Laden himself. Uh, and so I think the question is getting at the, to, to this, this question, you know, what about this long history and the ways in which the US uh, was involved, involved in the sponsorship of armed groups uh, when it was convenient to it uh, in um, entrapping, entrapping the, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And when you know, that shift between actors who were seen as you know, holy warriors and celebrated as freedom fighters in the 1980s and, and of course become terrorists uh, in the 90s and, and 2000s. So could you reflect on that perhaps? Well, Marlon, yeah, do you- I think just to tie into- Go on, uh, About before too, it was that um, the view on women, because during the Mujahideen war, wars, there were, women were not treated well during that time either. And then when 9-11 happened, it became convenient that women were treated poorly, mm. which it's all about the narrative. And it's very true that there has been a very long history of US involvement and it's all about which narrative that they choose or the Western world chooses to, to pitch to the rest of the world, I think. Yeah. Mm. To, to the extent that yeah. the U.S. was, was um, uh, culturally attuned to Afghanistan, or, or uh, even got culturally attuned after 20 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have this one, we know that the United States helped 
sponsor uh, some of the counter movement against the Soviets in, in from out of Pakistan, actually, and, and also recruiting people from the Middle East. Uh, that's that's a well established fact. But when uh, the military operation, th those were CIA uh, people, by by the way. But when the when the military operation was unleashed after 9/11, uh, that was by the military. Uh, I have this favorite anecdote from Elizabeth Kerr, a military sociologist, uh, who who could tell us. Uh, I think this was many years ago uh, when she came here and gave gave a lecture that uh, when the first special forces were going to uh, be parachuted into Afghanistan, uh, just the night before that, so suddenly somebody uh, thought of, does anybody, anybody speak to any of the languages here? The Dari or Pashtu, does anybody speak the languages? And so they were on this, this um, uh, aircraft carrier. Uh, so, they did, <laughs> uh, so they did an announcement, a question. Does anybody on this aircraft carrier, thousands of people on board, I mean, speak any of the languages? And it turned out that the one of the one of the cooks uh, was 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 from Afghanistan. So he was parachuted in <laughs> with the special forces. <laughs> so that was really a last minute uh, kind of addition to the, the special forces operation that uh, unleashed the military operations in in, in, in Afghanistan in, in, in late 2001. So um, the, the, the Americans, it, it took them quite a while before they became a bit more culturally attuned to the local circumstances here. And the, the question about uh, their knowledge about uh, the, uh, the teaching of uh, uh, young people in the madrasas in Pakistan and, and to what extent that also helped uh, uh, boost uh, uh, counter uh, US uh, military activities, uh, that's something that uh, I think people uh, at the upper echelons were probably aware of, but, but uh, tactically and operationally, I think it, it really didn't figure into any calculus, I think. Um, the, the, the Americans had a problem with Pakistan the whole time. I mean, they collaborated at some level, there was political discussions, but uh, part of the defense and intelligence establishment were supportive of uh, the Taliban and some other groups. Uh, so that was certainly one of the major problems. One big book that came out at some point was that actually we, we should be doing much of this stuff in Pakistan and not in Afghanistan. That's where we should be doing the counterinsurgency because a lot of the problem is stemming from that. That was perhaps an uh, exaggeration over, overstatement, but, but there was some truth to that. Yeah, no, I, I'm just thinking that that with the question, I mean, there's no way of, of taking, there's such a strong uh, colonial frame at work that it's impossible to, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it, examples like the one that, that's brought out here is, um, it's just so emblematic of this kind of, you know, this kind of colonial gaze, whether there's this other land where things can be changed and, and ordered around, but we don't actually have to know any of the peculiarities of what's what's going on there, and and um, uh, and I think the example when uh, the U.S. military um, started using the human train teams, the teams of anthropologists who were meant to come along and and provide local knowledge, and and the the kind of um, banality of that, and the way in which it was kind of thrown in as something that could be added, just simply as an add-on to you know. Uh, a war fighting project and, and I think there was again it's just um it's just another testament to that kind of um yeah well I mean arrogance really that that the lack of understanding of you know, speaking languages or you know having any sense that that would be necessary actually um in order to change to change things around but yeah I mean, and in, in addition to that you have you know the sort of collaboration with you know, people who have, as, as Malin was pointing out, who have, have previously done uh, uh, horrific uh, sort of human rights violations. And, and you know, and, and so uh, you have this consistent like changeover of like, you know, from, from the perspective, again, shifting the perspective, say, to, to the local. There was a great article just recently on um, this is sort of like from the perspective of, you know, a small village in, in Helmand province about like, you know, these changing sort of uh, local 
lords, overlords, uh, warlords, whatever you want to call them. Um, and and there are varied sort of uh, different ways of dealing with the local population, which also, you know, threw them for a loop. So, so to the extent that like, you know, what, what really is this project when you're not actually you know, you're not going in knowing that maybe you need to 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 speak the language. You you're starting a state building project without having any ideas, as the um, the uh, question uh, points out of you know what the local structures are, the tri the tribal structures, how you know how Afghanistan as a you know sort of state uh, you know it it you know state building is not an overnight thing, and it also is definitely um, uh, you know even very complicated in, you know, in Sweden to this day, right? I mean, you would, you would think of Sweden as, as a sort of functioning uh, finished state, and yet you have, uh, you know, the, the Sami population um, in Sweden also demanding um, their rights. So I think that um, this sort of, uh, yeah, I, I come back to the hubris um, with which um, a lot of this, this stuff happens and to the sort of longer, like you were just saying, colonial um, histories that that shaped us. That that um, particularly, I think, uh, from the U.S. perspective, uh, um, tend to get, I would say, maybe conveniently forgotten. Also within the U.S. context, as you were pointing out, the sort of you know white supremacist or or sort of right wing terrorism in the U.S. is never recognized as such, even though it's such a mm -hmm. fundamental part of the U.S.'s own state building project, right? And, and the sort of um, genocide of the Native Americans and so forth and so forth. So I think there's, um, yeah, I guess my plea today is sort of more inward looking, um, sort of uh, reckoning might be necessary. I mean, there's also no way of escaping the fact that the, the very grand frame of the war in terror with the small right and so forth collided with long-term American geopolitical designs. I mean, the whole frame, the way it was framed in terms of what became known as the axis of evil. So the United States uh, you know, identified three countries which were the axis of evil, Iraq, Iran, North Korea. Well, neither of them really had any immediate connection to the 9-11 attacks. Similarly, states which, or at least uh, elements within states that had connections, or, or at least that you could, such as Pakistan and the relationship to the Taliban, uh, Saudi Arabia, who of course were long-standing U.S. allies, they were pushed out of the frame and they were never really interrogated, not publicly. Uh, so th there was a certain amount of kind of uh, disingenuity in the way in which the, the whole thing was framed. And, and of course, people who were looking a bit more closely at these things understood that. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and clearly polit American political leaders also saw this as a moment of opportunity uh, and pursued it as such. Um, and most of that agenda, of course, has got us where we are now, uh, which, which hasn't served American political geopolitical interest at all. Let's see if we have another question uh, from the floor. We, we've got a few, we've got about five minutes left. Let's see if anyone wants to. Uh, question from Paula. How will the counterterrorism coin operation in Mali be impacted by the Afghan experience, do you think? Will decision makers in the UN, France, African Union and Europe change their strategy in any way? And it's a very welcome question, I think, because it reminds us that the war on terror isn't over. <laughs> there's, a, the, you know, there's a tendency to think, oh, well, Afghanistan's over, so now it's the end, but it isn't the end. It's continuing in lots of ways, including the counterinsurgency dimensions, and Mali is, a, is, a, is an important area where that's happening. So. Um, can you can anyone on the panel reflect on, on Mali specifically or, or more generally about you know the war on terror beyond Afghanistan? Well, I think it's winding down in, in, in Mali, right? And Losh may correct me if uh, but but uh, as far as I understand, uh, uh, most of the countries that have been uh, involved, uh, except perhaps France, which still has a significant uh, forces there, I think, are, are uh, winding down. And uh, I think it may affect uh, through second order effects in, in, the, in the sense that a number of um, the, the publics, I think, the, the, the electorate and the public opinion in, in, in most European countries will be less supportive of anything that smacks of nation building and institution building. 
So I think there will be uh, even less appetite for sustaining these. Uh, I mean, these are much, much smaller operations and missions than, uh, than Afghanistan, for sure. Uh, but I think there will be less appetite. So I think they will be wound down a little, a little bit quicker. But, but perhaps Lars knows more about, can say more about where we also, also Sweden in terms of its, its engagement. Well, uh, I think that it's... Uh... One of the things that I think that we will see in the region is that, I mean, we, we've had the, I, I talked about the, the, the state building capacities and, and the, the, that side of, of counterinsurgency. But for example, we, we've seen the regime change in this area. If you're an outside power as, as France, do you just continue with the same thing with the new state or it, will it become something? So I think that, uh, I think that actually, it will be not as focused on the state building part of it. I think that they will have uh, operations in the area, pretty regardless of which uh, faction is in the, 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 the different uh, states. So in that sense, I think that, uh, I mean, the, the, the recent operations in, in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq have somewhat taught, uh, taught the militaries uh, a lesson that uh, we shouldn't uh, engage in these big activities. We should be more, more pragmatic to them, I, I think. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm gonna give the panel members a chance now to, to, to maybe offer any concluding thoughts if, if uh, they have any um, on where we are now, where we go next, if there's anything that they feel they wanted to say that didn't get a chance to say. Let's see. <laughs> no. I, I can go go first. Uh, yes. I think it's it's interesting to think about the journey that Sweden has done during this uh, this area as as well. I mean, Sweden uh, security policy wise. I mean, we've always been leaning towards the West. But I would argue that it's not until 9-11 that we definitely took a stance. We are, we, we are now West. These transnational uh, uh, challenges that we face, we now face them together. And, and I mean, the, the prime minister uh, at the time of 9-11, Yaran uh, Pashan, I mean, he made that pretty clear straight from the beginning that this is not just an attack against the US, it's an attack against us all, going back to the, the, the previous speakers about identity, the us and them, we clearly choose us in this case. And, and uh, over the, the 20 years now that, that we've been faced, I mean, we have had military in, in Afghanistan, we have expanded our uh, security policy with the bilateral agreements and the, and, and the so, so I mean, Sweden has, has made a tremendous journey during this. Uh, 20 years and I think that 9-11 is, is, is a watershed in this uh, in this uh, aspect or, or or to an extent perhaps we revealed who we were <laughs> all along <laughs> because if we look at the security policy of, of Sweden during the Cold War we were kind of in bed with one side for the most part anyway so uh, there's also been some interesting uh, developments um, in terms of uh, revealing that Sweden has a fairly far-reaching uh, intelligence cooperation with Denmark and Germany uh, for, 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 for many years, for decades actually, that just recently became uh, public. Uh, so so uh, to, to some extent, we've been uh, certainly uh, with, with the West, but uh, your impression thought this was a good moment perhaps to to, to come come clean. <laughs> so I, I would just twist that a little in, in, in that direction. Uh, yeah, I feel like I've already said my, my uh, kind of sort of final overall thoughts, which is really like, um, uh, and maybe I even started there, which is I think that um, uh, I, I would like us to think about, you know, doing things differently. Like what, what are the opportunities? Um, what, what, what could have been, uh, and maybe this is, you know, even though we can't turn back time, but it might still be a, a good thought experiment to sort of think about, you know, what, what alternatives could there have been? And, and one, of the, one of the things I'm thinking about here is sort of that narrative also that's, that's quite prominent right now. You know, we spent 
so much money. Um, besides the fact, of course, that much of that money actually went straight back into the pockets of, mm. of people, uh, you know, in the US and, and in the West, um, uh, for example, for um, uh, military equipment. And you know, we don't need to go back to Eisenhower and the military industrial complex. But I think um, this, this question of like, what might have been done with um, you know, those billions and so forth um, in, in, you know, state building maybe in our own countries, right, or infrastructure uh, reconstruction or democracy process, or, I mean, the, the US, um, if, if we just focus there for a moment, um, you know, the, there is still no uh, free college, there's um, still, you know, sort of uh, bridges and dams and whatever collapsing left, right and center. So I, I think that, um, you know, is, is this really the best way to sort of spend our money and spend our um, whatever hour is anyway, because that's a whole other story where that comes from. But um, uh, I, I think I, I would like us to, to become a little bit better at imagining something else. Sorry. At imagining something else. Yeah, I mean, to uh, offer a concluding thoughts on a kind of, um, 20 years after 9-11 and uh, the end of the Afghanistan war. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's too neat and complete, this circle. It's difficult to kind of add anything to it. And I guess the question would be like, is this, you know, is this a circle, a parenthesis that we can now put around, you know, the 2001 to 2021 and, and, you know, the extent to which this, these two decades were really about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, um, and, I think not. I think there's a weird kind of um, contrast between what Shell was saying that for a lot of people, 9-11 um, actually wasn't that huge an event or for people who are younger than, than we are that, and that this, um, this, this, this round circle or, or parenthesis is just, it's just a continuation mm. uh, into the future. And, um, and I think um, the, the, the huge questions um, that, that they're there, um, you know, we'll have things, you know, we'll have, we'll have a relationship with our countering of terrorism and the way in which military force and might is, you know, builds an infrastructure around the world. But, but I think that there are, I think there are um, questions lurking that, that we can only, I mean, in terms of like imagining something different, I, I think there is a kind of question around democracy. I, I, I mean, and that would be my hope that there is um, within the whole fatigue with everything that's been going on within this circle, which couldn't be better summarized than having a, you know, a neat, complete 20 years and then the Taliban back on the day of the, I mean, it's just, uh, I, I, you know, it, it's difficult to, to add to this, <laughs> but yeah, that, that would be my lack of concluding thoughts, I suppose, but yeah. Yeah, I think I'm just going to echo what you uh, said. It's that we really have to be aware of our consequences and maybe do look inwards and do some soul searching both both as researchers mm -hmm. but as in in societies as well but um yeah and the consequences of our actions and the unintended consequences and thread very carefully now with afghanistan for instance and not maybe overreact thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, i'll abuse my roll this chair one more time in order to add a rejoinder to caroline and and and, and she I think she's absolutely right. We can't, we can't, we've got to resist the fact that this is a neat, neatly wrapped up period. But at the same time, there's a real big, real challenge in terms of how do we talk about this anymore? Mm. I mean, the whole, even the contract of the war on terror is a term that policymakers have dropped for 10 years mm. since the Obama administration. They don't talk about the war on terror. And now it, it will be a term that has even less meaning mm. given that there, there are no wars, uh, not, in, not in the conventional or at least in the Afghan or Iraq sense of it. So I think we're going to have to find new ways to talk about these issues, and it may no longer present itself in a kind of as a block in the way that it maybe did for mm. for twenty years or so. Mm. Um, so maybe that that that's a challenge for us and, and for our viewers, who um, most of them will be will be students with us. On that note, uh, I want to thank the panelists for, for all their wonderful insights um, and for what I think was a very stimulating discussion. And just to wish you all uh, a good evening and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.